Good evening, everyone. My name is Daniel Townsville, and I am the director of the Health Justice Student Assembly here at the Social Mission Alliance. Um, as people sign on, I wanted to get some housekeeping out of the way to save time for questions and for the panelists to speak. Um, we officially want to welcome you to our first webinar of this year titled Undeterred, Creatively Promoting DEI and Health Education Admissions in the Post-Affirmative Action Era. Uh, this webinar is brought to you by the Social Mission Alliance, which, for those of you who don't know, is based out of the Mullen Institute at George Washington University in D.C. In broad strokes, we look to expand the ability of graduate health education programs to prepare a diverse set of students to effectively care for vulnerable patients. Um, and so we work with a diverse coalition of faculties, researchers, deans, nonprofits, legislators, and thinkers to really push the boundaries on what we think is possible. But perhaps most importantly, we enthusiastically work with students and welcome your input on how we can best serve you. Um, as we know, <clears throat> a lot of the answers to our questions about how to serve vulnerable patients resides inside of you. A lot of our work um, is, is really focused on helping you all become advocates for the change that you want to see in the world. Um, most of you might know that we have a fellowship and a council uh, that provide enhanced training uh, for your health advocacy skills, and then we have webinars like this to empower you to address emerging health justice issues. If there are other issues you'd like us to discuss, please let me know, and we can talk about what's possible. Um, that said, today we are hoping to supplement what you might have learned about the Supreme Court case on affirmative action so that you can engage in informed dialogue with stakeholders in your community on uh, at least three issues in one I'd like you to understand what the ruling means, uh, what you can do, what you can't do. Uh, I'd like you to know a little bit about some creative race neutral practices that are already being used at other institutions that perhaps you can model at your school as opposed to trying to reinvent the wheel. And three, I also want us to look beyond just admissions and look at other ways that we can flood the pipeline with diverse providers capable of creating health equity among vulnerable populations. So, um, if Bruni is on the call, Bruni, would you like to introduce the speakers? And if she hasn't made it yet, I can do it. Okay, so in the interest of time, I'll go ahead and do the just speakers. Our first speaker is gonna be Frank Motley. Uh, he's an attorney and former Dean of Admissions at Moore School of Law at Indiana University in Bloomington. Our second speaker will be Dr. Maria Mortella Martinez, Chief of Family Medicine at George Washington University. Um, and uh, she's also the co-director of the Health Workforce Diversity Initiative at Social Mission Alliance and is also on the Social Mission Alliance Supreme Court Task Force. The third speaker will be Arena Horikawa, who is a Washington State uh, medical student and former uh, Social Mission Alliance Health Justice Fellow. Uh, fourth will be Dr. Rashid Patel, who is the Chief Equity Officer at the University of Michigan School of Nursing. And to be clear, she's not an admissions expert, but she certainly understands a lot about culture. Um, and so I um, just kind of want to be mindful of the questions that y'all might have for her. Uh, and then last will be Dr. Walter Conwell, uh, who is the Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer at the Morehouse School of Medicine. Um, and without further ado, I'll turn it over to uh, Dean Motley. I can't hear you, Dean Motley. I think you're muted. Good evening, everyone. My name is Frank Motley, and uh, as, as said before by Dan, I am uh, I was dean of admissions for, at Indiana Law School, Mauer School of Law, from 1977 to 2015. I also worked at um, Florida A&M University and uh, University of Kentucky for a small period of time. Um, my task this evening is to talk a little bit about the Harvard versus uh, students for fair admissions. Um, which is a law case that uh, was between uh, the Students for Fair Admissions, which is a, um, I'm not going to say right wing, but it's, it's a conservative uh, organization that was designed to eliminate, if possible, affirmative action. And this case uh, culminated in their, their victory. Uh, affirmative action has been around since the 1960s, uh, when Lyndon Johnson and others uh, introduced it to the public. And uh, it was desired to uh, show uh, America that uh, it was going to enforce uh, equal rights and encourages businesses to take affirmative steps to uh, create a, a, a diverse uh, workplace and ensure people that uh, they would look for and try to get more minorities in the pipeline. Uh, this policy, uh, having been around for more than 60 years, uh, involved simply uh, taking race into account in the uh, 
uh, applications the students uh, presented to uh, law schools and and and, and uh, businesses uh, for years, the uh, conservatives felt that this was uh, unfair and and wrong. And finally, when uh, President uh, uh, Trump was able to appoint three new members of the Supreme Court, uh, they had a majority of six that indeed adopted this uh, this quote race neutral or colorblind uh, view of the. Uh, admissions process. Uh, prior to that time, prior to uh, this case, uh, Baki had been the major decision and that decision had established that there was a compelling state interest in creating a diverse class and that that, that compelling reason justified some use of race in the admissions process. Uh, the Harvard case, which was against Harvard and University of North Carolina, Harvard being a private institution and the University of North Carolina being a public institution, uh, the six justices uh, held that the use of race uh, in the admission to, of applicants to uh, uh, higher education uh, was not going to be acceptable in long, any longer. Uh, their objections primarily was that they didn't think that diversity was sufficient justification uh, for uh, 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 making this uh, using race as a plus, and they didn't know how long that process would take. In Baki, they had talked about about a twenty-five year period. Um, I mean, in in, in uh, the the, the um, Gruda case, they had talked about it being about twenty-five years, and that that time was almost up. Uh, and they simply said that they didn't see the benefit that schools were going to uh, had maintained that diversity would bring. That is, they didn't know when diversity, the, the, the ideal diversity would be uh, established and how the court would determine that it had been successful. And for that reason, they decided that it could not be, it, it could not be uh, administered neutrally or it could not be administrated in such a way the court could tell when it had been successful. And therefore they decided that because of that, because they couldn't determine when success or failure had been made, that race should no longer be used in the admission of applicants to law school. So coming this, this coming year, it will be very interesting to see how schools approach this topic of admitting students without regard to uh, race. Uh, the court did make a note that one could consider race in the context of overcoming adversity, but that it could not be used as a plus by itself. It also did not mention whether the military, whether this decision would apply to the military. As you know, the military does use affirmative action, and it said that it would not make any decision regarding that. However, the Students for Fair Admissions Society has already taken on the military, and there will be a case before the court soon uh, discussing the issue of whether the military, too, should be involved in uh, elimination of affirmative action. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, can you, I'll, I'll hold questions for later. Um, uh, next up is Dr. Portella. Thank you so much for inviting me. And it's an honor to be among this, you know, group of very experienced and, and knowledgeable panelists. And, and thank you for creating an interprofessional panel. So I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about the work that Social Mission Alliance is, is doing in this space, but. You're all part of Social Mission Alliance, and as such, as Dan mentioned, you know whatever ideas you have in terms of how to, what what areas we could pursue further or look into more, we're we're all ears. The first thing, just thinking about all of you who are many of you are students or are in the process of your training is I agree that one of the most important things that you can do is organize organized in terms of you have a lot of power as a as a student as a paying you know trainee you're a very important stakeholder in your institution so um even though it may not feel that way and you, know, you may you may feel potentially like you're at the bottom of the totem pole you're really not you actually have a lot of power especially when you collectively petition when you advocate for yourselves as a group and you can create more than ripples you can create a, a, a big impact um, especially if you're willing to 
start a movement to create change down the road, right? And um, I'll give you like a really quick example that is not this example, but is 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 different. But it, it you know several years later it, it yielded into into I think somewhat of a powerful movement. So for example, I, I, I work at GW School of Medicine and Health Sciences, and GW doesn't have a school of uh, it doesn't have a department of family medicine. It may seem like a very very small issue compared to what we're talking about today but a group of students about seven six or seven years ago got together and um, students that wanted to either pursue family medicine or wanted more exposure to family medicine and they started getting together and being more vocal about the lack of family medicine exposure at our institution um, they wrote a petition and that petition was presented to key leadership people, including the dean of the School of Medicine and Health Sciences. And a year later, I was hired as the first family medicine um, hire in a long time to create a division of family medicine. And in a couple of years, in, in a year, we, we will have our department, right? That's a, just a, a small example. I understand that this is a much bigger issue and very, very important. What about the power that you have as students when you come together. And I would say that, you know, thinking about that power, I would also think about what type of skills you may be interested in building um, down, down the line that could help kind of spread the message uh, loud and clear. And part of that message is you, your your life, your, your experiences or the experience of your friend or of, of your mom or your dad um, and um, the, a very important tool could be um, public narrative, right? The ability of being able to tell your story and to help um, increase persuasion and to help drive a complicated point across. So a couple of examples that I'll share with you about schools that have been successful in spite of affirmative action being banned. I'll focus on, on the UC Davis School, which if you have already listened to the social mission, recent um, Alliance webinar that was last month. My apologies because you may hear some of those things again. UC Davis School is located in California. In 1996, there was a proposition that was passed in California that was essentially very similar to affirmative action. It was called Proposition 209. And it basically banned the use of rice in admissions. So basically very similar to what we're nationally now kind of um, going under or, or the same type of environment. In that moment, um, the schools in California and a lot of uh, social activists started uh, being afraid of, of what that would be, what future would be for diverse students and also what that would look like. And although in the first few years, right after the proposition 209, not surprisingly, the underrepresented minority students that applied and that got accepted went down significantly. Fast forward 15, 20 years later, the amount of underrepresented minorities compared to 1996 more than tripled. And they did that by essentially creating, by doing a lot of, a lot of different steps. And sometimes the more of these steps that occur, the more likely changes to happen, but also sometimes even just some of these steps can create change over time. One of the things that occurred is that enough leadership, which happened later, enough leadership um, got together that, that believed that UC Davis had, as a public school, as a public institution, a public mission to serve its people, right? It sounds very simple, very common sense, but a lot of our medical schools and other health profession schools and other institutions of higher education may have, um, you know, uh, scholarly and research as um, activities as some of their priorities, but not necessarily service, right? And when we don't look at service and we don't value service to the community, you know, in whichever profession, and maybe specifically more so in a profession like in a health profession, then people people suffer, right? We see we can see worsen of quality of care. We can see worsen in the experiences that people of, that people have when they when they look for health healthcare services. 
whether it be racism, discrimination, lack of cultural competency, lack of concordance, lack of understanding diverse languages and, and, and many other things, right? Um, so UC Davis came together and they also had a coalition of community organizations, which did not happen overnight. Some of these had already been partners for you know, more than a decade, but they started building a coalition, a, a stronger and more robust coalition of community partners that also were very invested in what diversity is. Um, and that, that coalition, may, you know, in part was made out of community colleges and other organizations that really believed and also carried the essence and were very diverse. Um, so they had uh, community organizations, this is me paraphrasing, um, some of what Dr. Henderson, Associate Dean of Admissions, shared, Antonia Flancher, and to the best of my ability, they had some support from the community and some pressure from the community. And as, at the same time, they had some leadership in the inside the institution that believed that the mission statement of the institution had to change. And this is one of those areas that I believe that students can really push on. Like you chose a school in, for many reasons and probably in part because of their mission statement or their values. And if a, if a school has in their values that they value diversity and inclusion or that they value equity, then that is a good place to be able to um, ask for some accountability. What does that look like, valuing diversity and inclusion? What does valuing equity look like? And beyond just valuing scholarly activities and, and, and research. Um, and if, if it's not in the mission statement, it's also a place where schools could be asked about why it isn't in the mission statement, right? Is this not a core value that we have? So that that goes um, in, in two different ways. Once UC Davis was able to revamp their um, coalition around their mission statement and they were able to really kind of refocus on their values and and what they actually wanted to do, then they um, gathered enough buy-in to be able to engage in this process of holistic admissions, which is very robust. It's not, what is holistic admissions? Let's just consider one thing besides this course. No, it is for them and for many, many other schools, because lots of schools are doing these things around the country, they did a combination of things. One is they created a mini mental, mini mental. They created a mini interview process that is essentially a process where an applicant could have many, more than six mini interviews where an applicant does not have the application open in front of, or they don't have access to the applicant's um, application after they've passed a certain criteria. They're not unique in, in, in doing this, and more schools have been doing this around the country, but they've been one of the schools that have pioneered researching this method as a possible method to enhance diversity. And the data on that is controversial, but it's still ongoing. But you can imagine how not having someone's scores in front of you may, may lead to potentially a more, a, a less biased uh, um, conversation and, and more of an, a conversation about where you're actually getting to know the applicant. So that's one tool. Then they created the Davis score as well. The Davis score is a school, a score that is based on socioeconomic disadvantage. So socioeconomic disadvantage, meaning parent, parental income, you know, um, also um, what their parents went to, like, are they, went to college, all of these things are rated in a scale. And that's related to a lot of data that says that basically almost a third of students, well, at least a, more than a fourth of students that go to medical school, just as an example, belong to the families that are in the top 5% of income, right? And then if you look, like in the next like 10 to 15%, there's like more than another quarter, right? Uh, that are, you know, in the top like 80th percentile or above. <laughs> and that's very disappointing because we know that um, that's leaving a lot of people behind, literally. And that's leaving even more frequently probably very diverse, uh, very diverse people behind. And then they also created, they already had all their efforts and I'm gonna summarize because I think I'm taking a little bit long, but they also uh, did all their efforts such as they had this system that was gathering data called uh, UC Prime that was um, to help increase rural 
rural health care providers and workforce. So they started creating this kind of programs to help people going to rural areas, but then those programs also helped as magnet kind of programs to, you know, attract more diverse students. And also they started creating pathway programs and that where they would offer special trainings to people. Another thing that they did is they also helped reduce financial barriers, which I'm sure someone will talk about more later, but essentially they helped reduce financial barriers related to taking the MCAT examination, preparing for the MCAT, you know, related to some of these programs that they had. And also um, they started offering scholarships that were need-based and I am paraphrasing um, and to, to what I understood in terms of once they, you offer the financial need scholarships or you and you offer some financial aid, then you're really starting to kind of make some of the field more equitable, right? Because it's such an expensive process to even apply. And then by creating the pathway programs, we're eliminating the mystery that people that have good social networks, usually people that are come from privileged backgrounds, get from access to information, access to other doctors or, or or people that are in that are in high places, right? That can that can deliver the information or, or introduce you or make other contacts. So I think I covered the, the, the major topics which were the Davis scale. I talked about the financial aid, the multi mini interviews, I talked about the mission statement, about a little bit about like coalition building and how they started looking and partnering with community colleges. I think the last thing that I want to mention is that um, they had this other scale. So the David scale is like the key, but they also had this tool called the distance traveled. And I love that, right? Because when we're thinking about, I love the David scale as well, it's focused on social economics, but the distance traveled is essentially like the David scale, a proxy for diversity, right? And, and lots of diversity and the distance traveled takes into account like how many jobs have you had as an example, right? Um, or, you know, how, what type of life experiences have you had? And they have a, a big list, right? And then the higher that you score, then that gives you a bump in your, in your application, like a sizable bump. And when they did a study between the Davis scale and the distance traveled, like underrepresented minority, um, representation more than doubled just with those two tools alone that do not explicitly explicitly use race into their equations. So part of what I would leave you with is that things don't look great right now. <laughs> we understand that, but there are many, many ways that we can utilize this to actually grow stronger and other institutions have done this. So from my understanding, I'm not the, the lawyer, and I know there are lawyers here. Thank you so much, um, um, Mr. Motley, for, for, for that presentation. But essentially, the, the Supreme Court decision, to the best of my understanding, it's, it's mentioning that you cannot explicitly use race as a factor of merit, but you can use race as a consideration of the personal statement of the applicant, their distance traveled, you know, there's their socioeconomic or their, you know, the the challenges that they may have had or they, that they have had due to due to their um, diverse status or or any of the above. So I think those were some examples, and then I'll stop there and happy to answer more questions later. Thank you so much. We'll save our questions for the end, but I'm sure there will be some questions um, about the UC Davis process. Um, as they've had such good results. Um, next up, um, Irina, can you talk a little bit about um, the admissions process at your school at Washington State? Sure, um, my name is Irina. I'm a fourth year math student at Washington State University. Um, uh, our school, so I was asked to be on the panel because of our school's admission process. Our school is like, um, it's a community-based med school that accepts people like residents of Washington State have significant ties. Um, our school is, I believe, one of the few places that um, they still initially screen um, applicants GPA and MCAT. Um, 
and I actually I looked at what that looks like and it's um if you have like a higher GPA then I think you're kind of your MCAT percentile was higher and then if your GPA was lower your MCAT score could be lower etc but if you meet that criteria then they don't show the MCAT in the GPA for the rest of the um, application process and which I believe sometimes at other med schools at the very end after interviews and everything they're deciding bet between two applicants um, they often look at GPA and MCAT scores um, and our school doesn't do that in, in an attempt to be um, more holistic um, I did learn some new newer things just in anticipation of this panel um, our school also does the multiple mini interviews as well, but I learned that now those interviews will be fully virtual for the time being for the equity reasons. Um, and then um, our school also has a pipeline program for um, Native students as well, and that's not impacted by this re recent ruling um, because tribal status is different. So. That's also something I've learned too. So that's not getting impacted at all. And I think students who go through that program have like a guaranteed or conditional acceptance into either a watch into this medical school, UC Davis, or the one in Portland, OHSU. Um, so those were some neat things I found. Um, and Dan, if it's okay, I'm just gonna share a couple like maybe student perspectives on on this recent uh ruling and one of the first things that i thought about whenever this ruling came out you know and them saying okay um evaluating based on adversity is just i feel like even before this um like college or even med school application especially for students of color was like this game of like i remember being advised um you know playing the minority card and and I rec also recognize that the students who brought this one are actually like East Asian students as well. Um, and there's kind of that layer of overrepresentation of East Asian students um, in this conversation. But um, oftentimes, like students were kind of having me to share their experiences of racism or just a lot of these traumatic experiences. And I was just kind of reflecting that before when there was affirmative action, I feel like you didn't, like you, you could check the box and that kind of like, like there was this level of like, I like I see that race, like I see you as that race. And now that's gone like the color with in the lines with color blindness, I guess. Um, so then it, there's like more of this emphasis on sharing like your race and your racial trauma. And I, yeah, that, that sucks and I know there's, like, I don't know, it's just, it's, I, I think that part's pretty frustrating as students. And um, even just looking at like, like my brother, who's actually half Mexican, you know, just started his uh, college, he's in undergrad now, but, you know, like you're asking some of these students of color who like had to navigate a very white high school being a minority and all of a sudden, like you're, you're kind of, you're you're like trying to navigate this okay now i have to use this really like traumatic very like i uncomfortable weird experience that i can't even name now like to uh now like in order to benefit me advantage me and now i have to like tell this story and also but and still in this like way that shows your resilience and how you're overcome this and now you're ready for college or medical school um, so yeah, and that's and then just even thinking about the the reality of um, the lack of underrepresented students in, in the medical field, especially that's just astonishing. Um, and I think even within our school, um, I'm not sure if they use some of these things that um, Dr. Portella was discussing with the socioeconomic things because they they like pride themselves in having a lot of first gen students. Um, I'm also a first gen student as well, but I was looking at the stats and I think it's, I think it was like 30% or 30, 30 to 40 maybe uh, on our website. And our school is pretty transparent with those, which is nice, but you know, like a majority of our, of my classmates was thinking it's like, oh, a majority is still coming from the higher income 
um, people did like majority of the people still didn't need a Pell Grant and um, still didn't need to get a fee assistance, et cetera. Um, yeah, now I think I'm just rambling a little bit, but. A quick uh, question, Irina, a quick question for clarification. <clears throat> so my understanding is one of two things. One, at Washington State, like it seems like once you get a requisite MCAT score, then at that point your application is then blinded and they no longer yeah. consider MCAT yeah. once you get to yeah. a certain they score. Don't, yeah, yeah. the interviews <laughs> don't see it during the MME or the multiple interviews and they don't, like no one sees it after that, after that initial screening process, no one sees it. Okay, and then the, then the other um, component I wanted to clarify is that there's a pipeline program and it sounds like that pipeline program is for people who have membership to um, a tribe, a federally yeah. recognized tribe. Mm -hmm. Yep. And because tribes are not race, mm -hmm. um, it's a race neutral way to bring in uh, yeah. represented students into the to the medical school. Yes. Okay. Yep. Very good. Um, I'm pretty sure we're gonna have some more questions on that. So <clears throat> um, if you can kind of keep your side your slides close or your feedback close, um, I'd like to come back to it. <clears throat> Just a point of information: uh, Is there a minimum minimum score? that you have to make before you go through blind? Yeah, so I can read those off if anyone's interested. So if you have like an undergrad human twelve GPA of 2.6 to 3.39, then um, you have to score a 61, uh, 61st percentile rank or higher on the MCAT. And that kind of, maybe I misspoke, like that kind of like, so I guess if your GPA was lower, your MCAT was supposed to be a little higher, like, if your GPA is like 3.8 or 4.0, then it's a, a 27th percentile rank or higher on the MCAT. Um, I can like get that link and post it in the chat. If you don't meet that, then you don't go forward. Is that correct? Yes, that is still the the part that I still don't like about our school, but yes, that is correct. Thank you. Thank you so much, Irina. Um, I'm sure people will have some more questions about that. Um, Dr. Patel, could you talk a little bit about um, what you're doing at the University of Michigan School of Nursing um, beyond admissions to kind of create um, a welcoming culture and, and, and make it a place that is attractive um, for underrepresented minorities and people who want to curb disparities to, to join that community? Yes, thank you. I'll do my I'll do my best to describe what we're what we're doing. Um, you know, as many of you are aware, Michigan voters passed Proposal 2 in 2006. And so Proposal 2 was a constitutional amendment restricting Michigan universities from considering race and admissions decisions. As a result of this decision, this school has been operating without affirmative action in our admissions policies for about 17 years. And so I'm going to share with you just three sort of legally aligned initiatives or strategies, if you will, that I've personally found in my role to be quite helpful in advancing our goals around DEI and re with respect to racially and ethnically diverse populations in particular. I share these with the understanding that best practices can look very different based on the geospatial contexts and politics within which you will be working and within which you will find yourself. So what I'm sharing is really what's working here, given our data and our politics. The first is creating opportunities and pathways to nursing education for economically disadvantaged populations. Over the past year, our school started a program we call EPIC Pathways. EPIC is an acronym for our institutional values to empower, practice, inspire, and cultivate respect. This program financially supports transfer students from community colleges to the University of Michigan School of Nursing with scholarships and stipends after they have been admitted to our three-year bachelor, three bachelor's degree program. The program is funded by a combination of internal funds as well as funding from federal workforce diversity grant, a foundation grant, other internal University of Michigan grants, as well as funding from our alumni and donor base. Our approach has been to deliver the greatest possible proportion 
of all the funding that's available through this program to students as direct financial support. Quite simply, in a ranking based on economic need, those students who have the highest unmet economic need end up getting the most in terms of economic support. What is interesting to note about this program with respect to race and ethnicity is that underrepresented minorities or underrepresented students are in fact overrepresented amongst those students who are transferring to our school from community colleges with economic need. So in this way, by paying attention to the complex and intersecting identities of our students, including students of color, we're able to promote access to higher education for historically underrepresented students. That said, the limitation of this model is that it does not inherently address the needs of racially and ethnically underrepresented students who may not find themselves experiencing academic, you know, economic adversity, right? We don't wanna generalize or stereotype uh, students of color and, and connect that to a certain class identity. Um, those students you know, experience other forms of educational adversity, such as challenges related to belonging, campus climate, and inclusion. So this is where our school-wide DEI strategy, which is also linked to the Epic Pathways program, is particularly helpful in addressing the needs of students of color across the socioeconomic spectrum. The second set of initiatives I've found valuable includes a suite of efforts to advance our institutional mission and vision around health equity, which is to promote health for all. This language, health for all, actually exists in our mission statement, which is really useful um, for those of us that are working for diversity, equity, and inclusion. These efforts within the school include curricular and co-curricular learning opportunities for students, as well as faculty and staff to increase our collective ability to address issues that stem from racism, xenophobia, sexism, homophobia, ableism, classism, and other forms of oppression. As part of our Health Equity Scholars Initiative, we, all, we are also hiring faculty with expertise in a broad range of health equity areas. We also regularly invite speakers on health equity. We even have an office for health equity and inclusion. While these health equity activities are intended to advance equity broadly speaking, we are able to integrate a strong emphasis on anti-racism and racial equity efforts as an essential component of this broader intersectional umbrella. So again, this concept of intersectionality um, sort of interpreted through programming has been incredibly helpful, um, I, I, I would say. The third and final idea, and I want to leave you with this, is that the affirmative action ruling here in Michigan in 2006 you know, it did, it did not restrict us from valuing academic excellence. It did not restrict us from valuing a racially diverse, equitable, and inclusive learning environment. It provided clear legal parameters around which we comply, but these legal parameters also encouraged us to think more creatively about models that can enhance our diversity. And this creativity was bolstered by the myriad opportunities we created as DEI leaders across campus to convene diverse voices of students, of faculty, of staff, of community members to think together, to work together, to share experiences, to have each other's backs. And so working to support a culture that values diversity, equity, and inclusion and threads these values throughout policies, practices, procedures, and programs has been absolutely critical to the, sex, to the success we have experienced in continuing to diversify our population. It's important that you know, within my school, all of our leaders, all of our faculty, all of our staff, um, our students participate in conversations, optional conversations around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And over the years, the voluntary participation in these conversations, it has increased over time. And when you have 
you know, an admissions director or an HR director or a dean or a faculty member who inherently values diversity, equity, and inclusion, they're able to, you know, interpret that, that value creatively in every aspect of their work. And so, you know, I just, I, I don't want to lose how important it is to just really forward DEI as, um, you know, part of a, a values-based strategy. Um, and I'm going to stop there. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Patel. I, I'm, uh, I'm surprised how much I'm hearing this theme of um, having a strong mission statement and accountability to the mission statement to really guide uh, being mindful from um, admissions to retention. Um, like not just getting you in the door, but creating the experience that allows you to flourish and, and prepare you to care for vulnerable patients at graduation. Um, great. So, um, and then last we have uh, Dr. Walter Conwell uh, talk a little bit about some efforts um, <clears throat> uh, at, at, at Morehouse and some HBCUs uh, that I think will, I think a lot of people are, 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 are expecting to see increased numbers of applications to HBCUs in light of what's going on. So I hope you can kind of shed some light on how ready the HBCUs are to receive these candidates. Absolutely. So thank you for that. And um, if possible, I was wondering if I can actually share my screen. Um, and as I get ready to do so, just as a quick time check, um, I know we want to pivot to a question and answer um, uh, uh, section. How much time do you think we have? Uh, I think we can do six or seven minutes. Okay. All right. I will do my best to uh, speak quickly. Um, initially, I was going to just uh, speak um, uh, extemporaneously, but I thought it might actually be helpful to uh, share um, a bit visually uh, with you. I was talking with Dan uh, in preparation for this meeting. We um, wanted to frame this around, um, you know, the flexion report and really taking um, us back in time. Um, obviously on this group, this organization is, um, you know, built off of um, an acknowledgement that we need to move beyond flexor, but then also wanting to look ahead into the future. But as we think back uh, to the past, um, both the establishment of, of the uh, HBCUs uh, writ large, um, and the role that they have uh, played in uh, graduating not only individuals but entire families out of poverty, recognizing the impact that that has on um, not just educational opportunity, but uh, really all the social determinants of health and uh, ultimately on health outcomes. Um, it's impossible for us to um, not think about the um, more than a dozen black medical schools that were also formed during um, the reconstruction era. And the impact that uh, the Flexion Report of 1910 had on those institutions, as this group knows all too well, of the eight Black medical schools that were evaluated by Abraham Flexner, only two survived. Um, that was Howard University and Meharry Medical College. And for the next 50 years, those two Black medical schools went on to produce 90 plus percent of all Black physicians, Black dentists, and Black scientists in this nation. It's also uh, helpful to imagine an alternate reality where this hadn't uh, uh, occurred. Uh, there was an article uh, just a few years ago that estimated the number of physicians, primarily black uh, and brown physicians we would have today if at least five of those schools had stayed open uh, based on uh, their enrollment, their uh, last few years of um, their existence. And um, if they had stayed open, we would have anywhere uh, between 27 and 35,000 additional physicians um, at this point. So we have to appreciate then um, uh, how this was uh, truly an expression um, and an assault on the political determinants of health. Um, this notion that political decisions, political and policy decisions have uh, social implications and ultimately health outcomes. Uh, that uh, term was coined by um, Daniel Dawes uh, when he was here at the Morehouse School of Medicine. And when we think of what you all can do, um, and obviously this is a complicated slide, um, but when we think of what you can do, it really does come down to advocacy. Uh, it comes down to using your voice both individually and collectively. You've heard a lot about that uh, today. Now, through advocacy, uh, 
there can be policy decisions. And one uh, such example of that, as we heard um, uh, earlier, was the Civil Rights Act itself in 1964 um, and subsequent efforts um, related to affirmative action, uh, which was really uh, well um, framed by President Lyndon B. Johnson when he was on the um, campus of Howard University um, in 1965, saying in part, you don't wipe away the scars of centuries by saying now you are free to go where you want, do as you desire, and choose the leaders you please. We seek not just freedom but opportunity, not just legal equity but human ability, not just equality as a right and a theory, but equality as a fact and result, and as a result. Really making very clear the difference between equity and equality and the um, need for affirmative action. Now, clearly we're in a different uh, place today, but uh, these efforts did bear good fruit. Obviously we had the opening of, um, or the acceptance of black students into uh, predominantly white schools. And we also had the opening of new black medical schools, Charles Drew University opening in 1966 and the Morehouse School of Madison opening in 1975. And these institutions uh, did have a um, dedication, a priority to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Our vision at the Morehouse School of Medicine is to lead the creation and advancement of health equity. And as um, we just heard, when you frame your mission and your vision um, and your values around diversity, equity, and inclusion, it allows you to build systems which are legal systems which are equitable to achieve that mission and that vision. Um, because of these efforts, we did have a dramatic increase in the number of black and brown physicians, but you also note uh, that we plateaued. Um, and we plateaued because of the inevitable backlash that um, occurred. And that's the history of, of our nation. Whenever there is a progressive move forward, there has always been a push backwards. It's, um, uh, uh, it happened at the end of Reconstruction with the uh, recall of the federal government and the imposition of Jim Crow laws in the South. It happened during the 1970s with the backlash against uh, civil rights efforts in the 1990s and early 2000s, as you heard, um, with the backlash against affirmative action efforts. So it's never a question of if a backlash will occur. It's only a question of uh, when and how. And definitely we're living in um, the setting of yet another backlash. Now, that's not something that we should become downtrodden about. It's instead that we should appreciate when we have windows of opportunity. And when we have those windows of opportunity, it's our responsibility to dig deep enough, build high enough, and to create systems that will endure uh, that inevitable uh, backlash. Now, one such system that we are building at the Morehouse School of Madison is one that is based on uh, collaboration and partnership, recognizing how important that is um, as we think about uh, revolution, uh, revolutionizing uh, community engagement and health equity. And one partnership um, is um, our More in Common Alliance. So we have a new partnership with Common Spirit Health, um, which is a merged entity of Dignity Health and Catholic Hospital Initiatives. It's now the largest or next to largest nonprofit health system in the country, right behind Kaiser Permanente, with more than 150,000 employees across more than 20 states. And this partnership, um, you know, which comes along with the more than $300 million um, investment, uh, will allow us to open up five new regional medical school campuses across the country. We already have students rotating in Seattle, Washington, in Chattanooga, Tennessee, in Lexington, Kentucky, uh, soon in Bakersfield, California. And along with, that, along with that, more than 20 new residency and fellowship programs across California, Colorado, Arizona, Arkansas. At Steady State, we will double our medical student enrollment, our PA student enrollment. We will be producing more than 300 new um, physicians um, per year. Uh, primarily black and brown physicians. Now, if you think about where this sits within uh, the historic arc, I told you coming out of reconstruction, we had a dozen black medical schools. By 1960, we were down to only two. Now with um, the More in Common Alliance, uh, the Morehouse School of Madison itself will have eight uh, regional campuses across the country. Along with our sister medical schools, Howard University and Meharry Medical College, um, as well as the four-year uh, school uh, that Charles Drew just opened uh, that we're extremely excited about, along with their uh, two-year program in collaboration with uh, UCLA. Uh, the new osteopathic school that Morgan State uh, uh, just uh, got approved for, as well as the um, allopathic school that Xavier is planning, uh, 
within the next five years, we're going to have more than 13 Black medical schools or Black training sites. That takes us back to where we were at the turn of the 20th century. So what I would tell you, when you think about where you fit within this, um, we encourage you not to become downtrodden. We encourage you to take a step back and appreciate the historic arc and recognize uh, that, the mark or, uh, that the arc of the moral universe does truly bend towards justice, but it doesn't naturally bend so. It takes energy, it takes effort, and we encourage you to continue to put that effort in to help it to bend towards justice. Wow. Um, don't know what to say. That's uh, that's, pretty... that's great news. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and we want to end off on a positive note. And and that's exactly right. I think we wanted to let you, everyone, know. And I was in such a rush to kind of get started that um, it's certainly okay to be disappointed or upset about the case, the ruling, and 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 what it means and. Uh, but that said, um, if you're thinking about that uh, Amanda Gorman code about how there's always light, um, there are ways. Um, and, um, and, and I'm hoping that we highlighted some ways today, whether at uh, UC Davis, uh, at Washington State, um, University of Michigan, and, and now what um, some of the HBCUs are doing. And with that, I'd like to open it to questions, if any of you students have questions. I'd like to say something, uh, and that is that uh, in the old days, people <clears throat> just wanted sort of to put some numbers together and admit some students and not put much time and effort into uh, admissions. They'd have one or two people doing it. And it sounds to me that after the uh, end of affirmative action in, in California and in Michigan, uh, institutions were committed to diversity, put more energy and time and effort into admissions. And I think that's one of the things that I think we will all notice now is that there will be some schools that will redouble their efforts in terms of the admissions office, in terms of resources, and some schools that won't do that. Some schools just want to rely on the numbers and admit people on numbers, and other schools will go to the arduousness of having interviews and spending time and effort in reading personal statements. Uh, and I guess that's the last thing I guess I'd like to say is that I think what, what we see now is there's going to be a lot more hand-to-hand -hand combat uh, to, to, to get the gains we used to, we used to make, and that some institutions will, will, will continue their efforts to diversity and other institutions won't. And if you're on a campus or involved with a campus that's interested in moving forward in this regard, I think it's important that we all work hard at that. But I don't think everybody is going to do that. There are lots of places that have very low incentives to put time and effort and energy into the admissions office or personnel. And, and Dean, um, Malia, if I can actually speak into that, I absolutely agree with you. Uh, really what uh, this decision will result in is a um, clarification of where institutions um, lie, a uh, clarification of what they believe in, much as we've seen um, uh, uh, things play out across the country from a um, uh, reproductive uh, rights standpoint, where we literally are uh, ending up with two different countries as far as uh, uh, the laws and on the policies and practices. I think it will be very similar. Those institutions, as you just said, that are dedicated to diversity, equity, and inclusion will continue to um, do that good work. Um, they may uh, reframe the, the words, they may uh, double down on the practices or become more um, innovative in their practices. And those institutions that um, weren't really invested in it. One, they likely didn't have much diversity to, to begin with. Um, and then uh, two, this just gives, uh, will give them a reason to further retreat from um, uh, these efforts. <clears throat> um, there is a question um, in the chat um, about, um, <clears throat> about how uh, primarily, how primarily black medical students were um, I guess we could say they were eliminated by the flexion reports. And then we talked a little bit about the Civil Rights Act, um, how it opened up the door some, and then it, and then obviously it, and then there was some more backlash. And I think the student is curious about what those forms of backlash look like uh, with regard to political determinants of health. 
Yeah, so um, and definitely I uh, would love to uh, hear the thoughts of uh, the other panelists, but I would say the backlash came in uh, many forms. I mean, as we know, between 1910 and um, uh, 1964, um, you know, when the uh, Civil Rights Act was um, uh, passed, uh, backlash was overt, uh, backlash was uh, physical, um, uh, particularly for those who lived in uh, the, the Southeast. There were uh, efforts um, uh, from primary education all the way through uh, to uh, graduate education to prevent uh, black and brown people from uh, receiving an education. And uh, from 64 uh, to uh, present, that backlash has taken different forms. I mean, a lot of the backlash we currently see is in the form of narratives. So we heard uh, that um, a bit earlier, the importance of sharing our narratives, but also recognizing that narratives are being created all around us. Um, and these narratives aren't random. So meaning the uh, usage of uh, terms like woke and um, trying to pair DI efforts uh, with uh, this nebulous woke um, uh, term. Uh, a couple of years ago, it was critical race theory, but uh, critical race theory wasn't was actually too complicated of a term for uh, many uh, to get around. So instead, there was a pivot to a simpler term. Um, that narrative generation um, is part of a very old playbook. Uh, going back to the Nixon administration, the long Southern strategy um, adopted and really um, uh, leveraged during the Reagan administration, ultimately codified into uh, Fox News by Roger Isles. This is actually um, a very uh, um, concerted effort uh, to create uh, narratives uh, that will oppose these progressive efforts. So I thank you, thank you so much for that awesome answer. Um, I I do want to take a, a quick moment to to highlight uh, alignment with your community. Um, as as students, you guys are only going to be present at school for four years, and that means that it's not hard for your footsteps to be erased, like you know, uh, footsteps in the sand at the ocean. And so, engaging directly with communities who can understand. Uh, what the challenges are that you face that can also apply pressure and have a long institutional memory. Um, it's certainly a strategy I'd ask you guys to think about as the community puts pressure on what a qualified doctor looks like. And, and some of the schools that you mentioned today do have community members on their admissions committees um, saying, I think this person is what a good physician looks like. I'm not sure what you think, but this is what I think. Um, <clears throat> So that said, I think I do have time for one more question. It looks like Alita has their hand up, if you can hear us. Yes, hi, sorry. I was actually typing it in the chat. It was, it was a, I guess, a bit of a, of a, of a loopy question. I, I did see that you asked me to put it in the chat. Um, so I, I guess my question was more so under, I think that it's great that, um, uh, that the uh, healthcare professional community is starting to regain grounds that was lost, uh, you know, in the era of the flex or post Flexner report. Um, but I, I guess I am, I was wondering if there were any best practices that um, were, that are known um, in terms of helping to close opportunity and achievement gaps for children that are like in elementary school and middle school. Um, I live in a predominantly black county, county in Maryland called Prince George's County, Maryland. And um, what I'm noticing, and even same thing as for Baltimore County, another predominantly black county, is that the opportunities for STEM and the opportunities for children to have uh, healthcare professional experience uh, before they even are ready to declare a major or decide that that's something that they want to explore out of curiosity are slim to almost null. Um, and, and the schools that do offer them are often in the more affluent areas of those two counties. And so there's this huge um, equity gap in terms of even just getting the children into the pipeline to see if they're curious, um, to, you know, to be able to get them to go into the pipelines. That's a really good question. Any panelists, I mean, it's it's, Multifaceted. Any panelists want to take that one? I'll take a 30 second stab at it. One of the one of the, the um 
possible strategies to help close the gap. I don't think that this is summarizing data that has been found, but it's summarizing best practices. And, and a lot of them are focused on pathway programs, which is replacing the pipeline programs, which is now identified as a, as a you know, derogatory kind of term in terms of um, towards American Indians. So the pathway programs, they're focused on the sooner that you can target kids starting with K and later on, then the more likely they are to be exposed to mentors that can introduce them to different career options, but also just even be more knowledgeable about what does the application process look like and help demystify a lot of um, what it looks like to apply as well as to compare them with mentors that can be more concordant in terms of their race, ethnicity, languages spoken, or, or diversity in general. Similarly, with the socioeconomic piece, there's some programs that have, um, in the financial piece, it's really important. So a lot of them have incorporated uh, financial literacy and you know applying for loans and like basic kind of accounting principles just so that students feel more ready to go through the very expensive application process. And they also sometimes include linkages to or resources shared in terms of you know, scholarships that they can apply to and as well as linkages with um, or resources with um, organizations in the community that are very interested in uh, and the highly value diversity right and that could be HBCUs, that could be Hispanic serving institutions or it could be um other institutions of higher education that have also kind of prioritized and and, and established the, the value of diversity and i think i'm going to answer really quickly patricia's question or an answer, but it was something about the PA schools, how, you know, if the PA schools are public, then they could argue that they also have like a public service. Um, with the PA schools, you're right, the diversity is looking worse than the medical schools. Usually when things are getting worse, it's a good opportunity to kind of help raise accountability and awareness about the the trend and help us for a change. Yeah, I want to say uh, I want to say something, and that is that uh, there is an irony in, in the fact that some schools are going to, uh, let's say, universities have a lot of money, uh, and there'll be community groups that don't have that money, and there may be those community groups that would like to have these kinds of uh, prep programs, getting students interested in the sciences. But the university says, why should we spend our money on people in the third grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade? And the challenge is, is people on the campuses have to make sure the universities, which when I say have a lot of money, they may have had 10 minority students last year and they're none, they're, they're five this year. And let's say we're giving scholarships at $20,000 each of those students. Well, that's like $100,000 that they're not gonna spend this year on scholarships that they could spend on these kind of prep programs, but they won't do that if someone doesn't argue for that. And I'm suggesting this, this is where the hand-to-hand -hand combat comes into, is you go to your dean and say, look, we have $50,000 we were going to put into a scholarship. Let's change that and put it into one of these uh, programs that will help students get interested in the sciences. And if you're persuasive, you then can redirect those resources to communities that don't have those resources and create the kind of programs that is necessary for, for to get students interested in the sciences. And so I, I guess I'm saying is those of you who are on campuses or, or in institutions that are gonna 
fall back in terms of resources to minority students because they won't be the minority students because of this recent decision. You need to make sure that money doesn't disappear and it's redirected toward uh, other diversity efforts until you know you get a chance where you're there, that you can re regain that number of minority students. But that money will get lost. There are you know if the decline is what I anticipate. What had experienced was what, what what was what was the experience in California and Michigan? About half the number of minority students we have on campuses will disappear. So half that money that we spent last year, we won't have to spend this coming year. And that money that went into the scholarships is going to be redirected to other students. And if there are people of you who are in DEI, should make sure that that money is redirected to other diversity efforts, especially that encouraging more minority applicants. Man, um, <clears throat> I think that's a pretty good note to just to, to end it on as this kind of thought of accountability. Um, I apologize that we've gone over, but I feel like every question was amazing. Um, <clears throat> I know that there are a lot of questions that I didn't get to, and so I've tried to direct message each and every one of you to contact me so that we can explore um, future subjects on this matter, because it seems like there is interest in, in looking really just beyond what happens to somebody in undergrad that wants to go to graduate health professional school and how do we look after others? And so um, to that extent, I just want to thank our panel um, so much for, for joining us. And um, and if you want to follow us um, on what was formerly known as Twitter or LinkedIn for our other <clears throat> uh, webinars that we'll have coming up this year, we, we'd love to have you. I'll have a survey where I'm, I'm also interested in hearing what other topics you want to learn about. And um, the Health Justice Council that we work with will review, you know, the data that we get and, and try to figure out how to create programming that's very narrowly tailored to your interest and uh, your ability to become the health advocates that you want to be. So thank you so much for your time and, um, and hope to see you on the next one.